Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to the Portage Network's first English language webinar of 2021. Put your work 20 times upon the anvil, the challenges of RDM training. My name is Jennifer Abel. I am the training coordinator for the Portage Network. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil in today's webinar, we're going to be talking about the following. Beyond the research data management institutional strategy, tri-agency and institutional policies and directives, and supporting various RDM tools, an important aspect of RDM is training members of the research community. Up to now, and for good reasons, training has focused on information professionals. However, the time has come to start sharing our knowledge with the research community, including researchers, students, and research office staff. This webinar will present the various ways used by three institutions from the Université du Québec network, what motivated this approach, and what are the next steps for training. We will talk about modes of communication, people's availability, and ways to reach a very busy audience. Before we start in earnest, a couple of housekeeping things to keep in mind. You have been muted automatically when you entered the room. This webinar is being recorded and the chat may be archived for those who are unable to attend. We encourage you to use the latest version of Zoom so that you have access to all of the features, including security updates, but don't update now because we're in the middle of the webinar, so wait until after. Please use the chat feature if you're having technical difficulties or have additional resources to share, and please use the Q&A option to ask questions of the presenter. Questions will be addressed at the end. You can also raise your hand if you wish to ask a question, and you can ask questions in English or in French. Uh, we have a code of conduct that we follow in these webinars, which you can find at the link on the screen, which will also be in the chat. Carl and the Portage Network are committed to providing a welcoming, safe, and harassment-free environment for its staff, membership committees, and working groups, as well as for participants, speakers, and organizers of Carl meetings and events. We do not tolerate harassment of any kind. Our presenter today is Jonathan Dory who is a research officer in research data management for École Nationale d'Administration Publique, Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique, and Université Teluc in Montreal. He holds a Master and a PhD in Information Studies from McGill University, and did very cool research, I have to say, in addition to being a certified translator. He is a member of the Portage Network Expert Groups on Preservation and on Research Data Management Planning, as well as on the Preservation Committee of BCE's Research Data Management Working Group. He is the Association of Canadian Archivists Outgoing Treasurer as well. And now, Jonathan, the virtual and pixelated floor is yours. Thank you. I will attempt to, yes, by pressing the share button. Uh, yes. There we go. So hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's session. Um, as Jennifer was introducing me, I, I remembered, I mean, I remember because I chose the title that the title in French is not an anvil, but a loom and you put it back on the loom a hundred times, not 20. So there's a little interesting tidbit, but the expression means the same thing and I'm pretty sure you get it. Uh, we always come back to it. Um, so as Jennifer was saying, I'm a research officer. I work for three universities. All three are part of the University of Quebec network. I am based at INRS. Um, along with INAP are both graduate only universities. Uh, INRS does scientific research in four separate clusters of research. INAP does public administration and uh, TELUC is our remote uh, university or distance education university in Quebec, part of the UQ network. Uh, for the presentation today, I will be speaking from Montreal. Uh, Montreal is uh, part of the uh, traditional lands of the Ganyangahaga or the Mohawk. Um, there are, to this day, still three communities in and around Montreal. Uh, Montreal has always been, a because it's an island, Montreal has always been uh, a place of uh, meeting, a place of exchange, a place of uh, sharing um, in many different ways across different nations, groups, cultures, uh, and identities, and hopefully will remain so in the future. I would take a moment to encourage you to learn more about your local communities, uh, get interested in their local cultures and language, uh, as well as knowing their histories. So for the presentation today, um, just gonna move this here. So for uh, today, we're gonna be covering, I mean, one general aspect of, of training, 
um, when it comes to research data management. So the various training formats that I've used. Uh, so either using a webinar, an in-class presentation, which was done at the graduate level, uh, developing different training guides, and also uh, I have an upcoming presentation at a faculty meeting. I'll then explain some of the justifications and benefits and difficulties that I face, talk about the next steps of what's coming up, and then we'll open up the, the, the session for questions and discussions at the end. I want to keep at least a good 25, 30 minutes for that. So if you have any questions, pop them up in the Q&R uh, button on Zoom rather than the chat throughout the presentation. If you, have, if you want to share links, if you have other things to share with colleagues, then use the chat function to do that. We definitely encourage you to do this. Um, and one thing I will say is that I have been doing some of these things for, for a little over a year and a half now. I am not an expert in virtual training. I am not a pedagogical expert. So sometimes in your institutions, you have staff like that. Uh, in any case, uh, refer back to their expertise. And some of you today registered have been doing presentations and training for much longer than I have. So again, please share your experiences. First thing that I would like you to do is, uh, if you have a phone, you can scan the QR code on your screen and do it from your phone. Uh, it's a quick poll, there's two questions. You can also go on menti.com and enter the code 2865954 or um, a link will be shared in the chat, um, which I will put in a second. There we go, thank you, Jen. Uh, so Jennifer just shared the link in the chat. Uh, you can click on this link. The first question is asking you if you've ever done online, or sorry, if you've ever done RDM training, whether it's online, in person, both, or never. Uh, I'll give you a second to um, start popping your questions, and then I'll be able to share the results in a minute. I just want to see here. So there's currently about 50 of us um, on the meeting. I will just switch screens. Bear with me for a second. So what this does, uh, when you go to uh, Menti, you actually can see that the results pop in directly. So I did this presentation yesterday and I forgot to log into my computer on Menti. So at the moment, out of the 50, there's about 40, 40 of you have answered uh, vastly different figures than yesterday in the, during the French session. So 13 of you have never given any RDM training, 14 now. Um, and the majority of you have given training sessions. Yesterday, the figures were completely the reverse. Uh, we had something like 50 that said no and uh, less than five had chosen the other options. So this is, shows that there's a lot of expertise in this group. So I actually do look uh, forward to uh, the, the questions and discussions at the end, uh, particularly to bounce back off my uh, experience. I'm going to switch now to a different question. You can stay in the same. Um, you can stay in the same uh, window. Um, this time, what are the difficulties that you perceive that are associated with RDM training for the entire research community within your institution? So whether it's the staff, the students, the faculty members, and for yourself. Um, so you can pop in different words. A word cloud will appear as people input their numbers or their their words. Um, obviously, I'm actually going to stop sharing this screen for a second just because I don't want you. Actually, I wasn't sharing the screen, which is even better. Um, I don't want you to get uh, influenced by what other people put, and I will share it after. And I'll go back to the first results. I thought I was sharing that screen, and I wasn't. Sorry. So any kinds of difficulties related to anything, whether it's you know organizing the meeting, reaching people, giving the presentation, the content, the delivery tool, whatever aspect comes in your mind for this. And this is what it looks like in real life. I'll go back to the other slide after. So we have about 20 or so people. So right now we're seeing time, buy-in, interest. Again, very similar answers to what was mentioned yesterday. 
uh, lack of interest, absolutely. Um, what I'm going to do after the session, uh, Jennifer is going to send out the slides for the presentation and I'll take the results from those two questions, add them to the slides and they'll be shared with you. So you'll be able to take a closer look to what those answers were. Um, and it just shows that we're all facing similar difficulties, similar challenges when we're trying to organize training sessions. So we're up to about 30 people out of the 50. So just going back. So this is what the results were. Uh, so eight said yes in person, six said yes online, 14 of you said yes to both, and 15 said no. And for the uh, word cloud, again, time, capacity, lack of interest, buying, interest, infrastructure, and so on. So those are not surprising answers in the least. Uh, if you're still inputting answers, go ahead. I'll go back to my presentation file. So when it comes to webinars, today's is a webinar. Um, so it's a useful format for training purposes. When, some, when one person or few people are talking and delivering content, it's a good platform to do this. It's a much harder tool to use when you're trying to foster online discussion. Online discussion is actually very hard to do. Um, headphones make it very hard cognitively to actually understand multiple people. When, when we're in a room, we have visual, like cues, directional cues as to who's speaking because we hear everyone based on where they're sitting in the room and you can, we can actually tune off people. Online, everything comes through two headphones, so it's actually much harder. Um, balancing the decision to go synchronous versus asynchronous is also a challenge. And it's a challenge when you are particularly announcing that you're going to be recording the session. So a lot of people will register uh, to a session, but may change their mind at, at the last minute, and that's perfectly fine. But if you've had a cap on the number of registration and people did not unregister or deregister, uh, some people that were on the wait list may not be able to do this. So again, uh, this goes to the following point of platform, but choosing between synchronous versus asynchronous may also come into play. Sometimes announcing that something will be recorded will play against you. At the same time, when you announce that something is recorded, it does free up the pressure of people um, wanting to register or not wanting to register. Going asynchronous also allows people to view the webinar or view the content later on. Um, obviously, we're dealing with a population or a public, an, an audience that is very busy, so trying to find a time where everyone is free is actually quite challenging. Using the various uh, interaction functionalities in the platform, all of which are platform dependent, is another thing. There are tools that exist. Menti is one, the one that I was just using. Um, Zoom allows us to do surveys. We have a chat function, Q&R functions. So trying to use these interaction functions during the presentation does liven things up. Uh, from the perspective of giving the training, it's always hard because you don't actually, I, I don't see any of your reactions. Uh, so I don't know if what I'm saying is clear. So we are missing as the person delivering, we were missing those cues. Um, also recording and sharing documents, which is a great feature of online. It allows us to share things. Sharing uh, an audiovisual file can sometimes be challenging with size. Thankfully, we all have platforms or access to platforms where we can put those files and people can view them. Um, in the case of a, um, a webinar that I gave in July um, on the search and usage of data repositories, so searching for data repositories and using the data in data repositories, um, it was done live on Zoom, but also I shared it on YouTube. So on the uh, RDM libguide for INRS, it is linked there. So we can actually use platforms like YouTube, like Vimeo. If you have an internal platform, you can use those to put uh, volume, uh, voluminous files um, that people can just view rather than downloading them. Same thing with documents, uh, something, a function like LibGuides actually allows you to share a video. In this case, I've managed to embed the YouTube video directly into LibGuides and linking to the slides, but also a transcription uh, of, the, the, of what I'm saying in the video. In this case, I uh, decided to go with subtitles in addition to me speaking, subtitles in French and English, uh, from which I downloaded the, um, 
the, or created the transcription file. I'll come back to this in a minute. Another way to do things uh, is in class presentation. In uh, October, I was invited to give a presentation on research data management in a course, first year, first semester course uh, on communications and ethics at an IRN, at an INRS. Uh, it was incoming graduate students, masters and PhD. Um, and the, the class focused for 90 minutes on um, research data management from the perspective of um, the data management plan. So I basically did this presentation structured along the sections of the, the DMP. So covering things of uh, documentation, then preservation, then uh, choice of repositories and so on and preservation. Um, obviously I know that this was new to all of them uh, we all have, including all of us here today, we all have practices when it comes to document management, to information management, whether it's ad hoc or more formalized if you've taken classes and record keeping. Uh, so we all do it, uh, whether it's good or not. And so we do it and often we do it and it's good enough for us. So the same applies to students. Um, I wanted to, um, and I was grateful to have an opportunity to do it this early on so that we plant the seeds of good data management practices early on. Uh, the, the class was me lecturing for uh, about an hour on covering the different sections and giving them advice and, and pointers. And the homework that was associated with this class was for them to do a micro DMP. So only covering the first three sections of the DMP and they had to give me point form answers as it relates to their research project, whether it's a master's research project or a PhD research project. A few of the students were registered as professional students, so they were taking courses to get a professional degree. Um, and so that became challenging for them. Uh, a lot of the going back and forth um, was me asking them, well, in, in, in practice, when, when you work in the field, what kind of projects are you working on? And how do some of those elements of research data apply to practical data or to professional data. And so everyone in the class actually did pretty well on that assignment. So that's, I don't know if it's me being overly optimistic um, or speaks to the quality of the students, I don't know. Uh, but I think a lot of those, you know, early on uh, pointers were well understood. Uh, Communication and ethics was the course that was offered in, in one of the four centers at INRS. Other coursework that could, a similar presentation could be organized in anything that relates to research, introduction to research, a research methods class would be good. Any kind of communication um, uh, or scientific communication classes could also be appropriate here. Third option is trying to develop training guides. There's a lot of different formats and there's a reason why we have so many formats. So the through a partnership uh, with the new common library catalog in Quebec called SOFIA, which is provided by WorldCat, uh, we all have access to LibGuides now. So a LibGuide was created, um, I've given you a screen capture of the one at INAP here. The one at INRS looks exactly the same, it's the same content. The visual appearance is different. It's blue instead of burgundy. Uh, the one at Teluk is also same content, uh, vastly different uh, style sheet, however, um, which is a good feature of LibGuides because you can actually import uh, guides from other institutions and reuse the content if you want to share it this way, which is why ours are all three the same. I've created it from the same template. Um, I've structured it so that it covers uh, an introduction as to what research data management is, uh, the funder expectations, which is, you know, there's a lot of information there, but there's very a lot of information we don't yet know. A section on the, the data management plan, covering and explaining the different sections, um, pointing to the DMP assistant, but also explaining within the LibGuides what are the sections and what are the questions that are associated, associated to each of the, those sections an area for metadata, an area for record keeping and preservation. Under data repositories, you'll find uh, the instructions to deposit in Dataverse, uh, in our institutional Dataverse, but also links to other repositories that exist. Uh, there's work left to be done here to cater those repositories to the fields 
that each of the universities are specialized in. And the last one is training, where I can actually link up the videos of the training sessions or the webinars that I'm giving, the, the material that's associated to this, the slides, uh, other links, and so on. Another guide that was created, and this is uh, a Dataverse guide, a quick Dataverse guide that was based on, I mean, I, I've used mine and I've based mine on the one that was done at Université de Montréal and Université Laval, which in turn was used on the one at, that Eugene Barsky had created for um, UBC. Uh, so how to create your account, uh, a reminder how to deposit uh, data sets in it. It's a two page, so I'm only showing you the first page here. The goal of this guide was uh, to remind faculty members or students who may or may not be depositing data sets, you know, once every month at the most optimistic level, but more likely once every semester, maybe once a year, maybe less often than this. So we don't necessarily remember how to log in or how to do a data set deposit. Uh, so it's a quick guide to re remind people how to do this. And in all this material, there's always a link back to me if they need more information. A similar training guide will be done for the DMP assistant um, once it's fully launched. So a lot of these guides are going to be catering specific uh, aspects. Um, I, we also have a project where we're gonna be creating shorter guides specific to some of the questions of the DMP assistant. So when we ask you about the formats, there's going to be a, a very short one-pager guide for how to think about formats and how to choose um, platform agnostic formats or uh, formats that are more suitable for long-term preservation, uh, for example. The last tool at my disposal so far has been the faculty meeting. Now I have a faculty meeting presentation. I was invited to a faculty meeting uh, on January 21st. So ask me in a few weeks how it went. Uh, it's a short and unique opportunity that I was given. So I'll be doing a 20 minute presentation and we'll keep 10, 15 minutes for questions. I'll really focus on what my role is, what the new tools that are available to the community. So focusing on Dataverse, reminding people of the institutional repository for open access uh, and also things coming up such as further the DMP assistant and how they can reach me. So it'll be sort of a high level, um, what can I do kind of pitch, sales pitch. Um, I really do have to focus my message and my messages because it's it's a very short amount of time. Uh, and depending on which university you're in, which faculty you're in or which department you're in, you may or may not be allowed uh, to present that those doors may be closed to you. Um, or sometimes the presentation schedule or the agenda will be set a few weeks or a few months in advance. So you may have to wait a little longer for you to be able to do this presentation if you are asked to do so. So when I say it allows you to easily and quickly reach faculty members, um, there's those caveats. That being said, it is, I think, the most effective way to reach most or all faculty members in, in a university faculty or department, because that's where they are. Uh, they're all gonna be attending uh, and you will have their, their attention for the short amount of time. So it's great to actually bring a message across. Now that we're all working from home, it's very hard to you know, use posters in hallways to announce events or announce different things, put mail, physical mail in their uh, cubby holes if they, or in their mailboxes if they still have those in, in your institution. So great opportunity. I'm very grateful that I was given that opportunity. Ask me how it went in a few weeks. In terms of justifications, benefits, and difficulties, so my role is to support three universities and I work at physically at one of them. So for two out of three universities, I've been working from, from home or remotely from day one. And within INRS, I work in one of four campuses. So again, for three of the four campuses, I always work remotely. So working from home for me has been a challenge, but not in terms of technology. I was already equipped to do all of this. The challenges related to working from home, the pandemic and COVID were, as all of us have faced, uh, hard to deal with. Um, but in terms of most of my actions right now are to, do, to develop common platforms. So yes, the institutional strategy will be different in each of the three universities, but there's a lot of commonality in terms of training material, training someone how to do a DMP, 
is going to be more or less the same. There's going to be discipline dependent changes, but the basic principles will remain the same. So a lot of those training materials are going to put in common. So that's why we chose to, to have one person doing it for three universities. So the big difficulties are scheduling challenges, as you know, trying to get people in the same room at the same time is incredibly difficult. Uh, hasn't changed much, even uh, while we're all working from home, we're all busy and sometimes even more so than before. Which is why I've been using different communication formats to reach people. So there's often a, the same message that gets sent in many different ways, whether it's a webinar, I will repeat stuff in a class presentation. I'll repeat it again when it comes to specific guides or communications with specific faculty members or students. I do want to target students, uh, which is why I wanted to do presentations during uh, or in class presentations. Uh, students are future researchers. They're at the start of their career, so it's easy to mold them if you want, uh, but it's easy to show them the best practices from the start. It's a lot harder to get someone to change how they've been doing things. Um, and, and I still believe that in most cases, we don't really have to unlearn what we've done. We probably just have to focus on specific elements and, and tweak those instead. But targeting students, uh, yes, you target future researchers, but it also helps us target professors indirectly. Um, one of the data deposits that I've done in Dataverse was that of a master's student who had graduated. And in doing so, we had to bring in the director, a faculty member at our institution, in that discussion asking, well, is this the data of the student or was this linked to some of your other research projects? And in doing that, we realized that it was indeed linked to other research projects. And so we opened, this we opened for this faculty a space in, in Dataverse. So trying to get students even at the end of their their, their study cycle uh, is a way for us to get and talk to faculty members. When you're doing uh, training, the issue of registrations and no-shows is always a uh, possibility. I think a lot of us, whether it was platform dependent or not, still have this idea that we have to cap training sessions. Um, and sometimes, particularly when it's virtual, we don't have to, unless your platform has limits. Um, and so often if, if a, a training session is very popular and you reach that cap, understand that there will always be no-shows. So people on the wait list won't be able to come in. So these issues, sometimes you have to balance what you want, how many people you want. If you're in a physical room and there's only 30 spaces, then you, want, you have to cap things. Uh, you could always encourage people to say, show up anyway. Even if you're on a wait list, we may be able to let you in. Uh, this kind of uh, issue has come up for me for uh, a, a, web, a webinar that I gave at TEDUK where we had capped it and we had a very long wait list. Um, and we fixed that by giving the training a second time. The issue of accessibility, which is something that I find is important, whether it's virtual or in person. Uh, virtual presentations open up the room for people that may not traditionally be able to physically go to a session. Uh, so in terms of accessibility, it's great. However, there's also issues, particularly for people who are hearing impaired, where especially in, in right now, I'm a little bit far from the screen, so it's hard to read my lips if you are reading lips or if it helps you to read lips. Um, the issue of accessibility in person versus virtual, in some cases your campus may have either a sign, la sign language interpreter or an interpreter for students uh, that is physically there in person. This person may not be able to uh, help for a virtual session. Platforms like Zoom allow you to put in um, live transcriptions uh, or live subtitling of what you are saying, but you do need to hire people to do this. So that, that's an, an, an issue of accessibility. In, in the form of accessibility, what I've decided to do for the video uh, that I've mentioned, the presentation in July at INRS, is to put subtitles. Now, I decided to do subtitles because we have a fairly substantial number of our students that don't speak French or don't speak French well. So we wanted to have them be able to access the video in English. So I wanted to create English subtitles from the get-go. 
And since you have to start somewhere, I figured since this is in YouTube, you can actually, when you upload a video on YouTube, activate the automatic subtitling, um, which creates the subtitle file for you based on what it hears in the video. It's a great tool. It's not perfect. You will have to go back and uh, check what was created. So mine was done in French. It actually did a pretty good job, uh, better than I was expecting, but I still had to create a, lo a lot of changes, um, either because I was slurring or because it didn't understand the pronunciation of certain words or it went completely AI at one point. Um, and from that file, that subtitling file that was corrected in French, I translated it into English thinking it would be easier than just redoing the video in English. It's not. It takes a lot of time, similar time to you doing transcription. Um, but at least now we have subtitles in French and English. From those files, you can generate a transcription. Uh, you basically upload it and then you you know, remove codes in, in a text file and you basically format it so that it looks like a text. So I've, I was able to put in the subtitles for accessibility, but also for language accessibility and create a transcription file for people that just wanted to refer back to something that I would have said in the, in the video. And that's an opportunity for you to make you sound a little bit more intelligent by removing some of the pauses and, and hesitations that we all have when we speak. Um, the volume of all these, the, the, the additional material that we create. So sometimes in PDFs, uh, links are not clickable depending on which version of an OS you have or computer. So whatever links I had in the, the PDF of the slides, I, I, I created below as a list of links, sometimes in French and English. Um, all of these functions are also tool dependent. I could embed a YouTube video in LibGuides. I haven't found how to do it in other platforms that I've used for in-app and Teluk. At Teluk, it's an internal platform. I don't even have access to the video, for example. Um, interaction with the audience is also a, a justification and a challenge. Uh, if you have multiple ways of reaching people, you can hopefully better interact with them. In terms of next steps, uh, we are still currently planning different presentations to be done on, in particular, in, on, on Dataverse. We launched our Dataverse instances in all three universities last year in December, uh, but we haven't announced it officially yet. So the, the, the official launch will be an introduction to Dataverse, what is Dataverse, what it can do for you. Uh, so we're going to be doing these presentations most likely in February or March. And as well, we're gonna do the same for the DMP assistant, trying to reach our community. Um, that may be a video that may just be, uh, you know, a short guide or an email to faculty members. Continue to offer in-class presentations and plan this ahead much longer. I was a bit last minute last, last year. I got in in August, uh, but do uh, contact, if you know different faculty members that teach specific courses, whether you know them personally or not, you can always offer, would you like us to give a presentation in your class on research data management and slip in open access and slip in library services as well if you want. And then creating uh, help material for faculty members through the Carrefour uh, de gestion des données de la recherche, uh, which was founded in a Shirk Connection grant. So this was the one of the two ways we found to centralize in one place the training material for three universities. Um, sharing material within one of these universities is challenging enough in terms of infrastructure. Doing so across three universities, we wanted to have something that was outside of that scope. So we're gonna be creating an online portal for all the shared training material that relates to research data management, uh, whether it's for the faculty members and students as a priority measure, but also the staff uh, from the research office, uh, ethics staff, and so on. And I will stop here. We'll open up the question, the, the question period and discussion. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking a moment of your afternoon to listen to me talk. If you have any questions, you can always contact me by email, jonathan.dory at inrs.ca. And for your questions, you can use not the chat function like I wrote, but the Q&R function uh, or raise your hand and I will be able to uh, answer this in an orderly fashion. Uh, and I know some people have asked, but the slides will be shared, yes. I'm just gonna stop sharing this for a second.
thanks so much for that, Jonathan. Um, we do have some questions that have come up in the Q&A. Uh, so thanks for those. And the first one we have is from Jonathan Petters, or Peters, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, who's wondering if you've talked to these three institutions, academic departments about including data management topics in their undergraduate or graduate curriculum. At the three universities, no. Um, one, because I'm new. <laughs> so maybe that, that is something to do for the future. Um, the tradition of adding a course or creating a course in a university in Quebec, I don't know if it's the same everywhere. It's difficult. Um, it often has to be uh, spearheaded by a faculty member, which I am not. Um, I have heard cases of people that developed a course and because of union rules, once the new course was offered, it had to be posted and someone with other more seniority basically took the course that someone else uh, developed. So, I mean, this is a horror story and, and you know, it happens. It, it, your, your institution will be different. Um, I know that in some specific areas, uh, there's efforts to create specific training sessions or right now I'm still at the point of doing a presentation in class for students. Down the road it might be a good idea to develop a full course into specific aspects of research data management, data preservation. You could or not add data analysis in this, so making this a data course for students, um, which I could only teach half anyway, because the whole data analysis is not my experience, my expertise, uh, but no. Um, if you are in a university where there is a faculty of information or library studies, and you would be interested in developing a course, you might want to talk to them and say, would you be interested in co-developing a course that could offer, be offered to future librarians and archivists or information professionals? Um, but that is, limited in Canada. I mean, there's only a certain number of schools that have those programs. But thanks, right. Jonathan, for your question. Yeah. Um, another question about the uh, the lecture that you were able to do to the grads, for the grad students, to the grad students. Um, do you have plans to do a regular check-in or monitoring of the students to see whether they're successfully implementing RDM during their research process? Um, no, and it's only because of time. I also don't have access. I mean, I had access to the class list while I was teaching, but once that's done, I no longer have access to the class list. However, I did say, and that was the last, um, my, my last slide of the presentation, that my help was available to them for the whole duration of their stay at, at, at the university. So if they have any questions that just like faculty members, they should contact me uh, for this. But in terms of monitoring, not really. I think that as I develop a relationship with more faculty members, I'll be able to basically join in uh, through that way, but not for now. That'll be another presentation. Yes. <laughs> Down the road. In a few years. <laughs> In a few years. There you go. Um, a question with a preamble from uh, James Doiron. Um, One of the main tenets, tenets of RDM is that it's a shared responsibility with many different stakeholders potentially being involved across various stages of the research life cycle. Are you able to speak to any experiences where you have collaborated with other stakeholder entities um, like research support offices or ethics offices or funders to deliver RDM training? And if so, any thoughts on successes and or lessons learned? I haven't done um, that yet. Uh, the nature of my position is that I am a staff member of the research office. And so my colleagues are research officers that review grant applications one of whom is also responsible for the ethics committee. So I do have a lot of advantages being part of that office, even though I physically work at the library. And I have a good relationship with the librarians as well, uh, as this is my background training. Uh, so because of that, I have support in terms of open access from the library. I have support from ethics and grant review from my colleagues, but we are still in the early stages. The rest, my, my department went through a lot of staff change in the last year at, 
in, in terms of um, directors. And so a lot of people were so overworked that in terms of de delivering training, it, that hasn't been the case. Um, the ethics training available at, NIR, at INRS, and I believe it's the same at INAP, uh, relies on the University of Quebec common training for ethics or the core two, the, the, the acronym that I only know in French, which escapes me now, by the Tri-Council. So the Tri-Council core two training uh, on ethics. That being said, we do have a goal to include research data management both as part of ethics and as part of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I've talked to the my colleague who's responsible for EDI and my institution. She faces the same dilemmas and the same problems that I have or that we all have in terms of reaching faculty members, delivering training, and so on. Um, so we're, we're close, but we're all building something at the moment. Great. Um, I'm going to skip down to Ted's question now, because I think this is kind of related. Yep. Um, Ted's planning a, a, a one-hour training to help researchers understand the benefits of using DMPs and why they should be internally motivated to create DMPs for each of their studies. Which yes. portage resources would be best to consult in planning for that? <laughs> uh, in terms of the, the actual specific portage resources, uh, I don't have a specific one to recommend. I think recommend the ones that make sense to you. Uh, recommends the ones that are the most appropriate for um, the discipline and the type of researcher that you have in front of you. Um, what I will say, and this is between all of us here and anyone that watches on YouTube, um, a lot of the, the, the benefits advocated for DMPs and research data management so far have been very, you know, high level, esoteric. It's good for open science. It's good for your career, even though we haven't changed the... Um, assessment and evaluation and promotional and tenure criteria to reflect that yet. And, and we won't be doing this, faculty members will eventually. Um, the way I present DMPs is really in terms of risk management. Um, it's a risk management tool. Um, everyone has heard of someone, students leaving um, with data uh, or my own, um, PhD advisor at one point was trying to contact a student who had moved back to Europe to see if they still had a data set that they needed for a current project. So this happens when you have a data management plan that plans these things and plans the transition of data set. When you clarify ownership of the data ahead of time, it helps you mitigate these risks. Uh, same thing when it comes to backups, if you rely on your university for backups, but you haven't had created your own, when you're locked out of your office, I mean, who gets locked out of their offices nowadays, um, and you don't have access to your data, that's a problem. Uh, and, and certainly that was one of the issues that we faced during the lockdown, the first lockdown that was announced uh, in March, where universities in Quebec had to shut down completely for two weeks. Um, that meant that for the first time in many years, sometimes decades, faculty members did not have access to their labs, their equipment, and their data uh, for a full two weeks, and that created problems. So obviously no one could have planned for this, but in a, in a data management plan, if you plan redundancy, if you, if you can plan redundancy, if you can plan backup, if you can think about these risks, um, hopefully that will help mitigate. So that's how I focus my my sessions on DMPs. It's risk management, first and foremost. Help yourself before you help others. Put your own mask on first. Exactly, exactly. Right, and, and I would just add to that, um, I, I would say that in the, the training materials that Portage has been, and resources that Portage has been de developing so far in terms of things like print materials, it has been focused more on the how and, and the why and sort of these big areas. And I think compiling some of the stories of things that can go wrong um, or the benefits in terms of, you know, the actual concrete day-to-day -day of how it makes a researcher's life easier is something that we want to work on in our, on an ongoing yeah. process. Um, 
because you know there is that that motivation is there um you know it's it makes your life easier as a researcher if you don't have to worry about being locked out of your office or if you don't have to worry about you know students leaving with stuff and not leaving you a copy or if you know just it's going to save you money if you don't have to recreate stuff that you accidentally put somewhere you can't find it anymore um so yeah we need I, I guess we need more of the the motivational material in addition to the the how and the big picture the big picture I mean, motivation and, and when i said that it's not it's not a criticism that's the way it's been done so far and you know, if we want to reinforce that message for faculty members, I think we have to push on certain practical things. Uh, James mentioned, and I think only uh, us saw it, that if um, he will be planning to deliver the MP Focus Portage session, um, and so the DEMPEG uh, will be providing more training resources. Uh, we're working on this. I'm on, also on DEMPEG with uh, James. So thanks, James, for that offer. Uh, also, a parenthesis before we go to Krisha's question, um, when we talk about simplifying the life of researchers as much as we can, uh, another thing that was brought up yesterday in the session is try to, if you can, to take a look at the internal forms within your institution. How does the ethics application form fit into not replicating or asking other questions that were put in um, grant applications or a research data management plan? Um, how can we simplify the internal forms of our universities to help uh, faculty members? Uh, I have colleagues that have integrated the DMP with the ethics application. So it's a single form that if you need an, an ethics application, it, it won't, you know, it'll populate those, those answers for you. Um, so is this something that we can do? You know, knowing that that approach has limitations, because you may only ask for an ethics application down the road if the project is funded and you already had to create a DMP at that point. But yeah. All lots of fun things to think about. Absolutely. Um, and the question from Krisha that you mentioned, um, when you worked with the master's student and the faculty member in putting data in Dataverse, the space that you created for the faculty member, was that still open or was it space for active research data? So we created the space in Dataverse, so it's not for active research. And that's one thing that I take great pains in reminding faculty members that Dataverse is for data that is not necessarily finished or complete, but should be close to completion. Um, I don't want our faculty members to use data, uh, Dataverse for active data. Um, So that was one of the issues. Uh, so yes, the space is open. Uh, it was a fairly large data set because it was a master's thesis in hydrology, uh, which created some issues in terms of upload. Um, but that was uh, that implied a discussion with the student and the faculty member uh, in the original submission that was sent to us, not in Dataverse, but separately to us. We had to remove some of the material because there were posters or texts or copies of articles that we could have put into our institutional repository rather than Dataverse. There was copyrighted material that we had to remove and we had to clarify the status of an, ex, uh, an executable file. Uh, so the student had to contact an, uh, another faculty member at another institution who agreed for us to put a copy of that exec file in Dataverse because he wasn't going to be preserving all the versions of that piece of software. So for the purposes of analysis of the student's data, he needed that version. So we did get that. Uh, so that data set is open, it's public, and it's attached to the faculty member. The reason we did it this way is um, I was having a chat with my colleague at Université de Montréal and her position is that in universities, faculty members are the most stable unit, if you want. Uh, faculties and departments can change. There can be uh, uh, restructures or reorgs. Um, so if you have a faculty member, that is most likely the person that is the most stable. So attaching a student to that professor makes sense, particularly in this case where the work of the professor was linked to the work of the student. Um, 
in cases where a student comes in with their own project, we can create a student dataverse uh, at our institution. And this is what Université de Montréal did. Um, that was also a way for me to talk to the faculty member, talk to his lab and lab members, create uh, their accounts in Dataverse, and now they can actually use Dataverse for their own, you know, more active needs, uh, rather than just waiting for students to graduate and put on. We had another faculty member who wanted to share a data set for an article that he had published. Uh, so we created that space for him. And so I hope that answers all your questions. Yeah, I'm not seeing any, oh, we have, oh, Krisha would like to ask a follow-up. Krisha, your mic is unmuted. Hi, I, you know, I just didn't think I could type fast enough. Um, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> to respond to, to what you were saying. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, you mentioned that the faculty, so you had someone who published data to, in support of an article in Dataverse. Yep. And mm -hmm. I've had, um, I've been asked if, um, so prior to like when when a faculty member is presenting their their article to different you know they would they might try to submit it to one uh, journal and they need to provide the data um, and then they might get rejected and have to submit it to another uh, journal and and do they have to go to the point where they create a DOI that can't you know with that stability and with that kind of rigid my understanding anyway of of that is that it's quite, um, you know, once the DOI is created, I don't know how easy it is to modify the underlying data or or you can't really, you know, um, delete the DOI. So yeah. I'm wondering um, how do I, uh, in answering this question, well, how would you answer this question, I guess, if, if somebody, you know, needs to present data, but then um, they don't want it out in the public, they don't necessarily want a journal that's rejected their um, article to still have access to that data. Um, yep. How, like, how would you manage that scenario? So, this I'm I'm sure there's people from Dataverse or Scholars Portal that can provide a, a better a answer after me. And it does lead me. So, thanks, Krisha, for your question because it actually does open up another question that I had about specifically this. So, the DOI is created for a data set in Dataverse. So, a data set is just a container that contains files. So, yes, you can change the files within your data set. What this does is the DOI will remain the same and the data set will just indicate that there was a modification, either the data, the file was changed uh, or you've added or removed files. So all those changes will be tracked. Um, so for a data set published in support of an article that is going to be published, it's definitely a possibility. You can put in your data file in a data set, the data set is associated to a DOI that won't change, you could potentially change the files as things develop. So at least it's there. The question that does bring to mind is how do you do this if you are submitting an article for review, for blind review? How does the link that you provide for your data set, because the, you can publish a data set which has a DOI, you can publish it restricted in, in terms that it's not public, it's not open to the public, uh, and then therefore you can give specific access to specific people to your data set, and it generates a, a private URL. But how do you generate a private URL that is also anonymous? Uh, so that's the question that I had. I've not had a question about this, but it's a potential scenario that I have in mind that, that brings you know, that's very similar to what Krisha was asking. So if someone has that answer, uh, go <laughs> ahead and, and share it with us. Uh, but it's, it's a way for us, I think, to use Dataverse in a more, you know, active data way in that you, a faculty member can place and share data sets on Dataverse for article evaluation uh, before it's published. That being said, you should never submit the same article to two publications at the same time, but um, we all know that. So I hope that kind of partially answered your question. I, I don't really have yet an answer, um, but we should bring that question up to the next uh, Scholars Portal monthly meeting. There you go.
agenda items already. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any further questions at this point. Um, and as a reminder, you can contact Jonathan after this if you have anything further you'd like to discuss with him. Um, and thank you again, Jonathan, for your presentation. It was, uh, it was great. Again, uh, if you were with us yesterday, you'll know it was great yesterday and it was great today too. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Um, a reminder that we will be having another webinar next week, um, which I'm just going to put the link for in the chat, which is going to be about schema.org for um, da research data managers. As well, Aaron has put a link in the chat for uh, a group of um, a data curation uh, community of practice meetup, which will also be next week, which you can register for. Um, so lots going on if you want to get involved with what's going on in the research data management community. And uh, yeah, I think we'll wrap it up there and have a great rest of your Wednesday. And if I haven't said it to you already, Happy New Year. We're almost two year. weeks through the year and we'll see what things happen as we go forward. It will be better. It will be better. It will, it will be, be better. different anyway. Yeah, well... <laughs> Sometimes the friend is good. There you go. Take care, everyone. Thanks.